there may not be a singular book of Joseph, but the largest narrative of Genesis covers Joseph in the book. This tells us that such an account carries great significance and as such is worth a special observance. Within Genesis chapters 37 to 50, we will discover the patterns of God's work through his providence and his promises for his people, all of which are interwoven through human fallenness, failures, and betrayal. Which means this, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. This is the picture and power of the gospel. Throughout the account, Joseph may be the central figure, but his family, especially Judah, draws a prophetic line to the coming Messiah. You see, through Joseph in the book, God is reversing the curse and revealing the blessing. And that is why in Joseph's life, we see a type of Christ, betrayed by his own family, only to one day be in the very position to save many. So as we trace the life of Joseph from a low pit to the high palace, let us learn the lessons and know the blessings of steady obedience to God's promises regardless of our circumstances. This is Joseph in the book, evil recycled for good. The team does an awesome job with those types of video resources, right? It kind of really sets the stage. It makes it easier for my mind and my heart to kind of be in alignment with what the Lord wants me to share. And you gotta understand this before we go any further. Genesis, as its name tells us, is a collection of origin narratives. You can take that word Genesis, and obviously it's translated beginnings. So Genesis or genealogies, or the word I like is the origin and the origin of various themes that God wants his people to understand. Did you know it's the first book of the Bible? Okay, we're off to a good start. <laughs> but it's also the first book of what is called Torah. Torah is a Hebrew word that means instruction. So when you hear Jews say, we study the Torah, they're speaking to the law of Moses, the instruction of Moses. Torah is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and of course, Deuteronomy. Genesis actually sets up those four books. Genesis could actually be called a prologue to the special formation of a nation. Without Genesis, you won't understand What's happening with Moses and the Exodus? And what's up with all these laws in Leviticus? And how about the book of Numbers? And then the second giving, Deuteronomy, second law. What is this all about? In those four books, as just mentioned, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what you're seeing is the family tree. All of us have a family tree, but God is showing us his family tree. Splintered and fractured as it may be, can somebody say amen? amen? Though it's jacked up and messed up, what springs forth from this seed plot of Genesis is going to be the promises of God for all of time. Now, a seed plot, if anybody keeps a garden here, you understand. A seed plot is a piece of land or ground where you plant a seed or a crop so that the plant can be transported. When you go to the nursery to purchase a plant, it was likely in a seed plot. That's what the book of Genesis is. All of these seeds and these threads that grow forth to different trees of truth, they're useful contextually in the book of Genesis, but guess what they're pointing to? A greater narrative. And I think that's the most important thing to understand, that Genesis is two large narratives that are both, in and of themselves, beginnings and foundations of greater narratives. And you have to read it that way. Let me say that again. Genesis can be divided into two large narratives, and we're going to talk about those briefly. And I want you to get this. If you keep notes or you have our app, what you will see on the screens will be what you have in the app. The large narratives of Genesis, 
they speak to the beginnings and foundations of other narratives that will make sense in what we call the New Testament. Narrative number one is God's relationship with the world, God and the world. And you will read about that one narrative in Genesis chapter one, all the way to Genesis chapter 11. God and the world. And when you begin to read chapter by chapter, you begin to see, by way of alliteration, so you'll never forget it, you begin to see the form of man as God formed man. That is crucial. The first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. That's all you need to know. In the beginning, God. And then God created. But the chief crown of his creation was the formation of man. In his image, he created them, male and female. In his image? Church, think for a moment. That is something you may have heard your entire church history. When God made man in his image, he was making image bearers on earth to reflect the image of heaven. He stamped his actual image on man so that man would represent him and have dominion, as you read in Genesis, over creation, whether it was the animals, Adam, you name them, whether it was the plants and the botany world, but he gave them his law. You might not read about his law in Genesis 1 and 2, but it's there because he told them, hey, don't touch the tree. Eat of every other tree. So you're beginning to see the formation of man, but as we know, the subtle, slippery, slanderous serpent creeps in in Genesis 3. And what does he do? He counteracts and he contradicts, did God say? This is always the Genesis of a lie. Did God say? The beginning of a lie that would eventually deceive, the beginning of fraud and confusion is the words, did God really say that? Is that really what he meant? And we're in the midst of a time where the argument is, did God really mean that? I mean, that book and those truths are completely outdated. Eve is deceived. Adam willingly takes, and we get the fall. So the image of man, formed in the image of God, is now tarnished. It's now altered by sin. The image is blurred. The fall leads to, one, <laughs> the very first blame. Adam, what did you do? I didn't do anything. That woman that you gave me, however, <laughs> Husbands, don't do that. <laughs> she blames the snake, and I can only imagine the serpent going like this. Yup. And then we're introduced to Cain and Abel, the first murder. Church, it's a downhill spiral from there. The fall leads to violence and evil and then eventually God looks at his creation and he is displeased. And we read about the flood. And the floodwaters drown out this God-forsaken world, this godless world, sparing, however, because God's grace is so good, he chooses Noah and his family to again repopulate the world to eventually be image bearers representing him. But by the time we get to Genesis 11... Goodness, you see a perfect picture of the rebellious nature of man, the flow of man. The flow of man in and of himself is rebellious. Don't let anybody tell you that man is innately good, inherently good. That is a lie. No, 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 man is evil. Our hearts are wicked. If we follow our own hearts, it will always lead to disaster and destruction and divorce and doom and death. And that's why the Proverbs say, there's a way that seems right to a man. My way is right, but the end therein is destruction. This is the flow of man. The Tower of Babel, as we call it, 
the chief architect, a man named Nimrod. His name means rebel. He's a perfect picture of man apart from God. Man's attempt to build something to get back to God. The tower is man's attempt to make it to heaven on his own. And all of this is showing a picture. Man's flow, trying to get to God on his own or even cursing God. And when you understand, God is saying, "Mm mm-mm, the flow of man apart from me is rebellious and disobedient. And that is why it's so crucial to understand without Christ, for man so hates the Lord that he's a slave to his only begotten sin. That sounded familiar, didn't it? Because it's the opposite of John 3, 16. For man so hates the Lord that he's a slave to his only begotten sin. This is the best I can do is be a slave to my sinful nature. That's the first narrative. Remember I said the first narrative looks hopeless, but it's telling a story. It's the beginning and foundation of a greater narrative. Couple that thought with a statement. Conversely, if man so hates the Lord that he's a slave to his only begotten sin, cue the gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, and this is when you read Genesis 1 to 11 and you gotta understand, like a watermark, who knows what a watermark is? Right, it's an image in the background of a graphic or a piece of paper. It's a hidden message in essence. And and you gotta look carefully. In Genesis 1 to 11, you're gonna see all these various imageries that are pointing to the Savior. That's the first narrative, God's relationship with the world. The second narrative is God's relationship with Israel. Right, you will find God's relationship with his people, Israel, in Genesis 12 to 50. Without understanding narrative number one, you have no clue what's happening with narrative number two. In narrative number two, we are introduced to key individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I promise you we'll eventually get to Joseph. (laughs) It actually breaks from chapter 11 to chapter 12 with the introduction of a man named Abram. And Abram begins this genealogy of God's family, that he didn't choose God, God chose him. And from Abraham, who has a son named Isaac, by the way, there was a second son named Ishmael, then Isaac had a son named Jacob, by the way, was a twin of the firstborn named Esau, and then Jacob's family, 12 children, actually 13, but 12 sons, and one of those is Joseph. What is the point? of narrative number two. Here's the point. God saves his people through his people, and then through his people, he saves people. God saves his people through his people or a person, and then through that person or people, his goal is to save other people. Is this sounding familiar with the role and goal of the church? It's because it should. The narrative of Israel isn't discontinued. It may have been paused, but guess why the pause occurred? To insert you and I. The Bible calls us Gentiles, right? Romans chapter 11 is a perfect chapter. And if you would bear with me for a moment, I thought it was necessary to connect some dots here with the nation of Israel, of course, as we're reading about it in Genesis 12 to 50 in this family and then make the connection with the greater narrative that you and I are a part of. So bear with me here, Romans 11, verse one. I say then, Paul writes, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, speaking of Israel. Now, 
Gentiles are being grafted in. He says, do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Wait, what? There's this spirit out there, this anti-Semitic spirit that has entered the church where people believe we have replaced Israel. No, we haven't. We are an offshoot of Israel. It's why we say Judeo-Christian values. So for any Christian to have any disinterest in Israel and the Old Testament is actually counterproductive to being part of God's family because we are grafted into that same tree. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Paul says, well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they did not continue in unbelief, will be grafted back in. For God is able to graft them in again. Like this whole entire account, and he eventually quotes from Isaiah, is saying God's not done with the Jews. God is not through with Israel. In fact, you are part of that family tree. You're related to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Who, by the way, the nation was called by God, his own inheritance. Exodus 19, verses five and six. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, God said. Speaking of Israel, why? For the earth is mine. God is making a claim on planet earth, mine. And these people, mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. All right, what has that got to do with us? Well, Peter would take that exact account in Exodus and apply it to what we call the New Testament church. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse nine, here's the link. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, here's the gospel, into his marvelous light. In other words, Israel, this special nation, was formed in the book of Genesis as God's family to be a beacon of hope and light to the darkness of the world around them. And when they shirked their responsibility to be a light to the world around them, and they prized themselves about being God's special people, and they lost sight of God himself, and God was constantly trying to get their their undivided attention through persecution, through losing their land, through Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, all of which God is saying, now Jesus is on the scene, my very representation in the flesh, and they missed him. And he passes the baton to the church of Jesus Christ. And our role is the exact same as Israel. We are a kingdom of priests, we are a holy nation. Hey, that is a very profound thought considering we are in the midst of an unholy nation and the church is supposed to be a holy nation. Remember, narrative one, Genesis one to 11, God in the world. Narrative two, Genesis 12 to 50, God and Israel. And the link between the two or the hinge you ready for it? Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three. These three verses become the hinge that connect both narratives. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth through Abraham's family will be blessed. This is still true. Those that bless 
the lineage of Abraham, Israel, will be blessed. In fact, when you do a deep dive into history, all countries that had a relationship with Israel, either positive or negative, those with positive relationships with Israel were blessed. And the moment they stopped blessing Israel, God's people, there was a curse. Empires literally fell because of the way they treated Israel. And I'm just saying that for us to consider where we stand in relationship with Israel as a country. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, don't forget that chapter, is the flow of man, the plans of man, the rebellion of man. It's a perfect picture, confusion. Genesis 12, as we begin, is the flow of God towards man, the plans of God for man, and the redemption of God in man. It's a perfect parallel. Abraham, who is he? He's known as the father of many nations, probably the most known spiritual figure in all of the world. Most world religions trace their lineage back to Abraham. Did you know that? Jews claim Abraham. Muslims claim Abraham. Christians claim Abraham. That's why the Abraham Accords in the Middle East are connecting all of these Arab and Jewish places to peace. Don't forget, Abraham had a son. His first son was Ishmael. Abraham's wife, Sarah, got impatient and wanted to give her husband a seed. So she gave her handsmaid, her servant, Hagar. Ishmael is the result of the work of the flesh. God said, I am not going to forsake my promise to you. Had you waited on me, you wouldn't have produced that work in the flesh, which by the way, the people of Ishmael to this day are a plague and a point of tension to the people of Israel. <laughs> but the second son, his name was Isaac. His name means one who laughs. He was the son of old age. Isaac had a son, actually twin sons, boys named Jacob and Esau. Esau actually was the firstborn, came out first, Jacob second. What is this telling us? Well, this is telling us, interestingly, in that dynamic, and you gotta get this, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not just up here talking for no reason. The first son should have inherited the blessing in the family structure. The blessing and inheritance of Abraham's dynasty should have been Ishmael's. But it didn't go to Ishmael. It fell to Isaac. Likewise, the inheritance and the dignity and the authority of the family of Isaac should have fell on Esau because he was the firstborn. But it didn't. It went to the secondborn, Jacob. And in these physical representations, God is saying, yeah, that's how I work. What I'm after is your second birth. Your first birth, you're born into sin. And we say it like this, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. It's the second birth that God blesses. The first birth, we're in our flesh and in our sin. The second birth, we are born again, as Jesus said it. Now, watch how this translates into the next link in our chain. In Genesis 35, verse 10, and God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Again, this is a perfect picture. If my second birth, the fact that I'm born again is the birth of the spirit, then I get a new name. And when you get a new name, you get a new nature. And God is saying to Jacob, who was known as a deceiver, his name actually means one who deceives, one who supplants. We know that he stole his brother's birthright, but that was God's plan all along. And then God comes in and goes, hey, 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 Jacob, that's your name of, in your flesh? I'm gonna call you Israel. That name means governed by me. And this church is exactly what occurs when you give your life to Christ. You go from being governed in the flesh to being governed in 
the Spirit. And like Jacob being named Israel, a new name brings a new nature. At least it should. And the danger occurs when many call themselves new name, Christian, but they don't have a new nature. They're still operating from a broken mind. They're still making decisions from a sinful heart. And yet we so easily take this name we just sang about, this holy name, this name above all names, and we take it upon our lives and nothing changes. That's why Paul would write in Colossians chapter three, verse nine and 10, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, your first birth, your sinful nature, and have put on the new man, ready? Your new birth, your new nature, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now we're back to the image of God. Because when the image of God was tarnished by sin, the mission of God was to redeem his image in man. Cue Jesus coming to earth to redeem what was lost. God continued to speak to now Israel as his name. This is a man. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. Back to the original command to have dominion over the planet. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac that's your grandfather and your father, I give to you. And to your descendants after you, I give this land. Are you seeing there's a buildup here? We started in Genesis. Now we're in chapter 35 and God is isolating his seed and his people. He identifies like your grandfather, the promise I gave to him in Genesis chapter 12. And like your father before you, Isaac, I'm gonna give you a land which is worth camping out here and saying, what you're watching on international news in the Middle East is exactly what God said would happen with his land. That there would be tension and contention around the land. And there's an argument, is it the Palestinians' land? Is it the Jews' land? Whose land is it? Having a biblical worldview knows, no, that's God's land, number one. So there's squatters in God's land, and that's why there's tension over there. But this is what you gotta understand about God's promises and God's faithfulness. And make this personal with where you're at. God's faithfulness is covenantal, not contractual. And somebody should get excited about that point. Here's why. If it was a contract, trust me, my life has already broke every single thing Yet God's like, no, I'm going to actually cause my covenant and my faithfulness and my promises to maintain their integrity. After Genesis 35, Genesis 36 is a peculiar chapter. It's the genealogy of Esau, right? Esau's people became the Edomites. The Edomites became the Amalekites. The Amalekites produced the Agagites. And now we're in the book of Esther. <laughs> Genesis 37, we made it. If Genesis 36 is the genealogy of Esau, Genesis 37 and beyond is the genealogy of Jacob. Genesis 37, verses one and two. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan, the promised land. This is the history of Jacob. There you have it. Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brother. Stop, pause, wait a second. What the heck just happened? We went from a guy named Jacob. Now we're in, in, introduced to a guy named Joseph. And the rest of Genesis is going to be more or less the account of the life of Joseph with a few pictures, like Genesis 38, about Judah that is telling a greater narrative. And this is what you can't miss. So while these stories or narratives in the Bible are enjoyable, they're easy reads, it's telling a story about our lives today. It tells us that Joseph in the original language wasn't just feeding the flock with his brothers. You gotta get this. He was actually shepherding his brothers who were shepherding the flock. In the original language, this phrase speaks of Joseph being 
the authority over his brothers. And it tells us he's 17 years old for a reason. It's telling us something's happening that is not typical or traditional. He's the younger brother. He should not have any authority over the older brothers. And it tells us the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. Who were they? His father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Stop, pause, and consider this. I don't expect you to memorize any of this, but I want you to have a point of reference, contextually speaking, with who these people are. We were introduced to two names, Zilpah and Bilhah. So I wanted to put together an image that shows you Jacob's family and what just occurred in those first two verses. Jacob had four wives. I do not recommend anything I'm about to say next. <laughs> Jacob's family was so dysfunctional. You think you got a dysfunctional family? You think you have a divided family? You think you have a broken family? You have not read the book of Genesis when it comes to Abraham's family, Isaac's family, and Jacob's family. There you have on the screen, Jacob's two main wives were Leah and Rachel. They each had servants, Zilpah and Bilhah. Underneath of them, you see the 12 boys that they had. Leah had Simeon, Ruth, and Shep. No, that's Leah Glancy, that's Matt Glancy's wife. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and of course, Zilpah had Gad and Asher. Now Rachel, she's the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, and then her servant, Dan and Naphtali. And there you have the 12 sons of Jacob. It tells us that Joseph, in that order, He's the second youngest. Benjamin would be the youngest. He gives a bad report of his stepbrothers to his father. Okay, now you're understanding the four brothers he's giving a bad report about. Now, this has been a point in Bible commentaries where you get two different roads. Some say he's reporting to his father as a tattletale. And they run and make their case about, you know, he, he's, a, he's a spoiled little brat. And I'm going, I don't see it. I don't see it because it doesn't tell us that. In fact, it tells us the opposite, that he is like the foreman yeah. on the job site. Yeah. And he's reporting the truth. the truth. So he's not a tattletale. He's a truth teller. And he is being a good steward at 17 years of age with what his father has entrusted to him the authority over his brothers. And he's reporting back to his father, which obviously does not make him popular amongst his brothers. This is what you gotta get. He's operating with integrity and accountability regardless of being popular. And I think that's an important point to make today, how important it is to be truth tellers, even if the truth gets you persecuted or opposed by your own family. Are we still willing to be accountable to our Father in heaven with what he's entrusted to us? Because that's what integrity does. And what you'll notice as the account unfolds is Joseph's integrity, he, it gets him into some trouble. That's why integrity, in my opinion, often threatens those who lack it. Just as light threatens those who live in darkness. Just as righteousness often offends a world of unrighteousness. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? See, when heaven puts a blessing upon a man or a woman or a family, you can expect hell to try to circumvent it or curse it. Now, it does not help. Joseph's cause, that verse three tells us, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. You gotta understand the history here. <laughs> Jacob, Israel, was also the favorite of his mom, which created tension in his family, and now he's giving favor to one of his sons. There are several reasons why. Joseph, obviously, in the previous verse, has integrity. There's something to be said of that. It also tells us he's the son of his old age. Well, the wife 
of Jacob that produced Joseph and Benjamin was Rachel. And the Bible tells us Israel loved Rachel. So there's a connection between her children and not the other children. The two other servants and even Leah herself know Rachel's children and he's advanced in age. And there's something about having children when you're advanced in age. And I know this from personal experience because my father is in fact one of five boys. And his second, the second, well, he's the youngest. The person above him, his brother, is 10 years older than he is. And then there's like brothers that were like 15 and 18 and 20. So when his mom and dad had him, they had a 10 year old in the house and they were advanced in age. And he would tell you he was highly favored. There was like special treatment, my dad would say. They sent him to private school. They kind of you know, nurtured him and they, they spared him. Like, and, and I think that was because they were older. Like they treated him like a grandson as opposed to an actual son. So I understand what's being said here. It also says that Israel gave Joseph. Now here's what we know of the book and story of Joseph. A tunic of many colors, Right? You guys saw the play. It's not necessarily what it means. It's not the main focus that it had many colors. In fact, the original language might tell us that it was just a, a tunic of honor or a decorative robe. It was a robe that, for example, if you work in construction, when somebody shows up with a suit, they might have the hard hat on, but you automatically know who's the boss because everybody else is wearing construction clothes and you're dirty and, and you're getting the work done. He just shows up. This is kind of what Joseph's jacket signified. When he would show up as a 17 year old, he's got this coat that had long sleeves. He was the boss. And you better believe that came with its own connotation that he would possibly inherit the family name. Can you now see why the brothers are getting jealous and envious towards this one? And it tells us that. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. It's not new. This is the theme of hostility that is continuing through the book of Genesis. From Cain killing Abel, from Isaac and Ishmael to Jacob and Esau, all of these tensions within the family are telling a greater story. Abel's blood that would cry out from the ground for retribution points to the Savior's blood that would be given to man for redemption. Isaac is a picture of the sacrifice that the father would make. Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son Isaac. God interrupted him to make a picture and a point that that's what he's going to do with his son as the sacrifice. And then of course, Jacob's name being changed to Israel is a picture of the Christian who takes God at his name and at his nature. And Joseph, oh, beloved of the Father, yet belittled by his brothers. That's Jesus. Do you know Jesus came to his own? His own biological family didn't even receive him. His brethren, the Jews, didn't receive him. Joseph is going to give us a perfect picture and a foreshadow of Jesus. And we're gonna make so many different connections, like that watermark beneath the surface that is pointing to Jesus. Now we get into these two dreams and this is where we'll end. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Again, people have said, look, he should have kept the dream to himself. I don't see it that way. I see maybe there's some immaturity here. Maybe he should have read the room, but he's just telling his dreams as he's given these dreams. The second dream he has, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. He must not have understood their countenance and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and moon and the 11 stars, there are 11 brothers, they knew exactly what he was saying, bowed down to me. Now again, two dreams, we don't know how much time passed. The first dream obviously did not make him a friend of the family. The second dream, this is basically the icing on the cake. The picture I put here just gives you the imagery. The first dream obviously involved his, his sheaves and all the brother sheaves are bound to his sheaf. And then of course the sun, moon and stars 
are also bowing to him. Now the father is present for this dream. And it says in chapter 37, verse 10, 11, so he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him. What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to earth before you? The mother had passed away at this point. So Jacob's like, wait a second, you're telling me I'm the patriarch of this family? Your mother's not even here and you're having a dream where your brothers and your mother and I are bowing to you? I believe, remember, he loved Joseph. I believe this was a subtle rebuke to spare him from the animosity and hostility that the brothers would have put on him. Because the ver verse that we land on and end with says this, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. If you do a little cross-referencing in the Bible, you, you see that same phrase occur in Mary's life. In Luke chapter two, verses 51, when they lost Jesus in the temple and they go back and find him and she's like mad at him. Like, son, where, where were you? D didn't you know me and, me and your father were worried sick about you? And Jesus says, why are you worried about me? Don't you know I'm the be about my father's business? It says, Mary kept these matters in her heart, right? The 12-year-old boy that he was. Jacob keeps this matter in mind. No doubt, as the story unfolds, he would remember these dreams that Joseph shares at 17 years of age. Notice something that we'll end with. Joseph's dreams do not see the imprisonment. They only see the appointment. Joseph's dreams do not see the humiliation, they only see the exaltation. Joseph's dreams do not see the betrayal. They only see the blessing. But if you know Bible, you know there is no honor without humility. And there's no spiritual growth or spiritual development or character in Christ without trial, without pain. And it's why God recycles all that is evil in this world for good, to make us more like Jesus. And that's what we're gonna study as we look at Joseph. That spiritual maturity doesn't develop over time, it develops over trial. So I know, I know a lot of old fools and chronology and age has not made them mature has not developed their character. And just sitting in church Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, year after year, I've been a Christian my whole life, does not equate into spiritual maturity. No, God adds an ingredient. It's called trouble. And that's why James would write, consider it joy when you fall into various trouble or trials. And know that trials and trouble produce patience, maturity, and patience works in you to make you complete. That's why Romans chapter five says we glory in salvation, absolutely, but we also glory in tribulation. Why? Because tribulation produces perseverance, endurance, and endurance and perseverance produces character. And character, hope. So I know we've all come in here with different trials and troubles, and I want us to look at the book of Genesis and Joseph and recognize no matter what's happening with you or to you, God is looking to do something in you. He's looking to make us more like Jesus in these last days. So like our study in Esther, there's providence, but more specifically, we're gonna see God's presence. We're gonna see how adversity doesn't harden Joseph's heart and prosperity doesn't haughty Joseph's heart. Adversity and prosperity both humble Joseph's heart. We're gonna see the main verse, which is in the final chapter, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. This is Joseph in the book. Evil recycled for good. Let's pray.